Hello, I'm Dr. Ian McCullough at Accenture. Today I'm going to be talking about an improved method to measure the daily COVID-19 transmission rate from incomplete data. Specifically, we want to measure the daily reproductive number, RT. You may have heard of r naught, which is roughly the number of new infections for every case of COVID. And we provide a daily estimate of RT in the presence of incomplete data. There's a big data quality problem surrounding COVID with over 3,000 public health offices, uh, county public health offices, many with different reporting standards and systems. About half the people that have coronavirus uh, are asymptomatic. They spread the disease yet don't even know that they're sick. Uh, there's insufficient testing resources. Uh, insurance plays an impact, uh, as you'll see in, in some of the other papers uh, at this conference. Uh, HIPAA rules um, also affect reporting. There's delays in reporting. So just when a case is reported, it could have happened uh, days or weeks earlier. Uh, there's inconsistent standards on defining what is a positive case, uh, especially over time. And there's no authority that the federal government has to enforce any of these standards or rules on uh, county officers or state, uh, state governments. So this becomes a data quality and engineering nightmare. And under this backdrop is where we're going to talk about how we can estimate a, a better reproductive number and better uh, compartments of, of the disease. Uh, so uh, when the disease began, if you may recall, think back some months ago, um, the, we, we learned that data engineering and visualization efforts are, are insufficient. So, uh, the leading model that was presented in the U.S., uh, and you see in the upper picture here, uh, predicted a total of 60,000 U.S. deaths with uh, the COVID cases declining to zero by the, the summer of 2020. Clearly, that did not happen. Uh, there was an alternate model uh, that was also briefed to, uh, to the White House, um, a cubic model, that also predicted a rapid decline in deaths. And, and when you look at these models, right, these are empirical models, they're basically looking at the trend and they're trying to, uh, to predict uh, what, that, uh, what that disease propagation, what that disease spread will look like. But neither of the models uh, in, uh, in the early days reflected uh, anything about the transmission dynamics of COVID. So, so the, the peak and decline is an artifact of the modeling procedure, not what's actually happening with the disease. Uh, some of the key shortcomings are there's, there's no consensus between the different models. They all provide something different. Uh, there, a lot of them are inconsistent over uh, time and location. So that, uh, you know, a model in Wuhan, China is gonna be different than in Florida uh, in the US. Uh, and the, uh, even if you vary the time windows, uh, the model parameters are gonna change significantly uh, as you look at different uh, time periods and, and different states between even Florida and New York. Uh, there's hyperlocal estimates. Uh, any accuracy is very short term uh, for a matter of days. And uh, I, I would argue that these results are not mathematically or statistically valid. So what, what can we do? If we turn our attention to uh, mechanistic models, mechanistic models are ones that impose your understanding of the disease on, dynamics onto the forecast of, of the spread of the disease. Uh, but what we found is, is when you have poor data quality, it leads to nonsensical predictions. So we took a model that was performing very, very well, uh, it was proposed by Arenas and colleagues, um, and it was performing very, very well in Spain and in Italy, uh, in the EUA, EU. But when we attempted to fit them to US data, we had uh, absurd results, right? So if you look at the, the chart here, uh, our model using that, that basic same model that was working well in Spain and Italy, uh, is producing uh, the blue line, which is very, very high model prediction, yet the actual cases are being reported uh, clearly is, is not uh, being represented by this model. And so we, we now learned that that is due to the initial conditions that we had or understanding the case counts, uh, the true case counts of coronavirus was problematic. So um, what you're seeing in the chart to the left is our estimate of, uh, of, of New York cases of coronavirus. And so the, the little circles that you see um, in, in the, uh, at the bottom here represent the reported cases of coronavirus in New York uh, during this period of, of mid-March uh, through May. And then you'll see the blue line is representing what we think the most likely estimate of actual true case counts are. Uh, and this paper was published in uh, Frontiers, uh, uh, I guess published uh, a few weeks ago. 
Um, so the problem is that because the case counts are so significantly underreported, the initial conditions for uh, the model are off, and then that totally affects uh, the, the model dynamics. So we need to rely on a method that allows us to infer the missing data that we need to drive the model. And so we're going to rely on Bayesian data augmentation as a method to do that. So with the Bayesian data augmentation, we are going to use the death data as the most reliable data that's reported on coronavirus. And, and there's a few reasons for that. But we're going to use the death data to then reconstruct a Markov chain and then use Monte Carlo via a linear noise approximation to address the uncertainty in, in our estimates. And we choose to use deaths rather than, uh, than actual cases because why some deaths might, while some deaths might be misattributed, they're rarely going to go unnoticed. And um, we, we can do a little bit, uh, have a little more confidence in that measure. So what I'm showing in the uh, plot here um, to the right is the seasonal average in the gray band. This is reported in the Washington Post. Seasonal average of deaths in the U.S. And then the black line rep reports the, uh, the deaths uh, in 2020. And so what you'll see is there is a spike that occurs here in the middle of March. Uh, going up through April, right, as this gets significantly higher. And you see the area in the dark shaded area is, uh, can be attributed to COVID deaths. And the light shaded area uh, is deaths that have not been attributed to COVID. And what I would argue is because you see this line remain relatively flat here in, in the uh, middle of March, and then it spikes and the slope follows the slope of the increased excess deaths, uh, what I believe, uh, my interpretation of this plot, is that we fail to account for some of the early COVID cases as deaths due to uh, reporting standards, but most of these are attributable to coronavirus. Uh, however, uh, we can get a fraction of which deaths are attributable to coronavirus and which ones aren't, and so we can use that in building our estimate of what we have partially observed even in that death count data and then we use that information to infer the rest of the, of the disease uh, dynamics. So for those that aren't familiar with the Mar uh, Markov chain, Markov chain basically assumes that, that people fall into one of these compartments of susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, or dead. And I know that there is this asymptomatic period. So some people break the infected into, you know, been exposed, you're asymptomatic, uh, yet infectious, and then you're infected. Uh, for our purposes, we've just lumped them together and say, hey, you're still shedding the disease, uh, the virus, so you, uh, you are infected. And so uh, we are basically going to uh, um, then have a transition probability that's estimated, and this is a fairly known process in epidemiology, of, of what is the probability that a person is going to move from susceptible to exposed to infected to recovered or dead. And so then if we understand the death rate and we understand the parameters for, tra for uh, uh, transition probabilities uh, from clinical literature, so these are more controlled studies, they've been replicated a number of times at this point, uh, so we can have a lot more confidence in those. And the references for those are, uh, are, are provided in the paper uh, as well as the parameters, and I also show you the parameters here. So the other thing that we need to do is because we have this death, we can use linear noise approximation allows us to invert this equation estimating the number of deaths through the Markov chain and allow us to uh, estimate the, uh, the actual true infection cases. And we can go all the way back through for that susceptible to exposed. Um, and that gives us our ability to estimate the daily reproductive number. So here are some of the results that we have. Um, so this shows the compartments of the number of people moving in the first graph from susceptible to exposed, then from exposed to infected, then infected to dead, and then also infected to recovered. If you recall, there was those additional compartments. And so what you're seeing is, uh, as we do uh, Monte Carlo, this is uh, generating a, a random draw of, uh, of numbers and then going backwards through the Markov chain to estimate each compartment. And so that's what gives you that light blue shaded area shows you a bunch of the different trials and then the dark line is the uh, is the um, maximum anterior uh, anti posterior and what you'll see is the dots here for deaths or the actual death count data uh, fitting the model fairly well let's look at that a little more in detail so if you look at this you can see that the circles are the actual reported deaths and this case i believe is for the state of florida 
And so you'll see over time, the depths are actually fit very well by the smooth model uh, from our estimate. Now the nice thing uh, we've also done is we validated these model fits against serology reports. These are random samples of the population and they're tested for antibodies. And so then we can infer from that what, you know, because it's a random sample, we can infer what is the true number of people that have been uh, in, infected with the disease. Now, of course, that might still underreport because you have se several people that are uh, asymptomatic and uh, they, don't, they don't choose to go and get testing and there's a number of reasons why, why that's still undercounted. Um, if we look a little closer at Florida, um, and, and we look at during the periods of uh, the lockdown is imposed on, on when Florida was under a state of lockdown, and we also look at uh, when their phase two reopening was, right? And so now keep in mind the dark line indicates the number of people that are being infected, and the circles are the reported cases. You can see massive underreporting during the initial lockdown of Florida uh, through uh, you know, a April to May. So significant underreporting here. And then even in their second wave, we can still see that that is undercounting the number of cases of, of those with coronavirus in Florida. So this also allows us to look at that susceptible to expose compartment, which is, uh, uh, allows us to measure the daily reproductive number. And so when we look at the daily reproductive number over that same time period in Florida, Right, we can see that there's two peaks. And what's interesting, uh, you know, Florida is, is, is an example uh, that we see in, in many states. You'll see that the first peak occurs and then there's a lockdown. And what we observe is the peak in transmission risk, this, this peak and then drop off, occurs uh, days and weeks uh, before any government imposed lockdown. And it does not appear that the government imposed lockdown hastens the decline of that daily transmission risk. So it really begs the question, did the government lockdown really have an effect in curbing the spread of the disease? Or is the same information uh, about the spread of the disease that, that alerts people and, uh, to take precautions and to stay at home and to wear a mask and to take other protective measures, uh, is that same information that's alerting the public also alerting the government? And, and it's just uh, uh, coincidental that the government lockdown occurs during this period of downturn. Um, it is clear, however, that once those government lockdowns are removed too early in those states, you see uh, people getting a false sense of security and you see an increase in, in daily transmission risk uh, following a second wave. Um, and so I, I do think that the lockdown still serves the purpose of, of you know, employers that may require their employees to come to work and those employees want to be more uh, cautious and more safe. They don't really have many options. So I think the government lockdowns do help under those conditions, but uh, it is uh, clear that, uh, um, that, that the peak and the, the behavior of, of limiting the spread of disease uh, occurs well before government lockdowns. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. I've provided my email address and that of one of my co-authors, Kevin Kiernan. Uh, I'd also like to thank Trevor Kent for his work on this paper as well. Thank you very much.